Okay, um, let's get started. It's uh, 9.32. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us so early on a Friday morning. The, um, it's our great, great uh, pleasure to, um, to have uh, Subhu uh, Venkatraman to be our speaker today. Um, Subhu has it all. He's uh, worked in industry in R&D. He's uh, been an academic publishing more than 270 papers. He's been a head of a department building up the, uh, the biomaterials at NTU, and he uh, uh, has a CEO of three companies, spin-off companies, from his research. So, and, you know, sort of has, has done everything in the domain of uh, biomaterials. So today he'll sort of give us a, an introduction to this, this area of biomaterials and tell us some of the latest developments that he's working on. Uh, the format uh, for today's seminar, I should say, today's seminar is a a joint uh, uh, venture by the Center for Advanced 2D Materials. Um, and we thank uh, Antonio for the support and by the MSC department and thank Barbaros for, for his support. And uh, this joint uh, uh, seminar, will try a little bit of a different format. We'll first have a very a shortish uh, talk by the speaker. So around 30 minutes. Then we will sort of uh, have a panel discussion and we have uh, where we're, we have uh, some very prominent uh, panelists, uh, um, you know, Antonio and, um, and uh, Bazan and um, Daria and uh, Georgia, and they will sort of engage the speaker in sort of a, a conversation and a dialogue for, you know, for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will open it up to questions. But sometimes if you sort of give your questions ahead of time, that can work its way into the panel discussion. So, you know, please submit your questions using the online, uh, uh, question box. With that, and uh, you know, without much more ado, let me uh, thank uh, Subu not only for being the seminar speaker, but also being for part of the committee that's designed uh, this whole seminar uh, series. So, welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. I hope at least fifty percent of what you said is true about me. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about my research interests first before I talk about the nano side of things. Uh, basically, to sum it up, uh, my research interests are based on finding materials related solutions to medical needs. So almost by definition, the materials I work on are sort of central to the performance of the device or the delivery system. And without them, they, there would not be a device or a therapeutic product. So that's sort of the basis of most of my work. I don't synthesize new materials like Prof. Guy Bazan and and uh, Prof. Antonio do, um, nor do I discover new drugs like uh, perhaps Georgia does. So most of my interest is, again, as I said, uh, in the material side of things. And I shamelessly use other people's materials, modify them to suit the particular medical need as, as I go along. So these are examples of such uh, materials related solutions that I want to talk about. So, you know, um, if you look at the history of implants, they have gone from being completely bio inert and biostable over long periods of time, such as an artificial hip joint or knee joint, uh, all the way to being fully degradable in the body while being bioactive during their period that they are in, uh, the, in the body. Okay. And that helps to guide the differentiation of stem cells, for example after implantation, uh, development of organoids, molecular cues being delivered by the... So my interest is mostly in the bioactive side of things. The materials have to be not only either stable or degradable, but uh, have some biological function by virtue of either a drug incorporation or by virtue of molecular cues being part of the scaffolding that is used. Uh, more recently, biomimetic bio materials, which also include self-assembled systems, um, are going to probably replace some of the synthetic materials that have been used for a long time. Uh, this is driven by a combination of uh, good properties of the biomimetic materials, as well as uh, ease of manufacture, environmentally friendly manufacturing schemes. In the particular case of nanomaterials, therefore, to proceed with the same theme, I look at materials um, whose size and to some degree surface functionalization is key to the performance of the delivery system. Without them, basically, there will not be a therapeutic that uh, is available. 
Okay, so that's sort of the thrust of my work. And uh, I have subtitled this talk as when only nano will do. Again, emphasizing the fact that these are uh, applications where the nano size it plays a very critical role. Okay, so to put this again in perspective in the area of nanomedicine, uh, traditionally speaking, people have classified nanomedicine into four subcategories. The first of these is uh, the area of therapeutics, drug gene or vaccine delivery. And I'll have a lot to say about vaccines later on. Um, uh, these form the predominant market uh, share for nanomedicine products. Um, this was in 2006, 75%. But in 2020, they reached 20 billion in sales. So most of my talk will be focused on successful productization efforts uh, in each of these categories, but mostly I'll concentrate in this area of drug gene and vaccine delivery. There is ex vivo diagnostics, um, which is mostly using colloidal uh, gold nanoparticles, for example, to uh, diagnose or to, to, to detect pregnancy, for example, that's sold over the counter. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this at all. There is in vivo imaging, which is mostly super paramagnetic nanoparticles that are used for MRI imaging to improve resolution and contrast. Mm, um, size is important only in the sense of uh, biodistribution in this case, um, not for actual functional performance. Um, and then there is the area of so-called bioactive materials in tissue engineering, and I'm not going to touch on, touch on this at all. Of course, we have to keep in mind when we talk about nanomaterials that nanotoxicology, either during handling or during actual performance in the body, uh, have to be taken into account because nanomaterials have a sort of different toxicity profile compared to macron and micro materials. Okay, so when we talk about nanoparticles, I want to uh, make sure that um, the size range that I'm talking about is roughly between about five nanometers to about 100 nanometers, and they can include all kinds of particles, dendromers, self-assembled liposomes, and so on. Okay, so that's the size range we are interested in. Why? Because these are the ones that make a difference uh, uh, in comparison to microparticles in their, for example, biodistribution in the body, okay, after injection. So most of the uh, applications that I'll talk about involve uh, injections, intravenous or subcutaneous or localized injections. And the distribution of the particles after injection is a very important uh, performance characteristic. So if you look at this slide, uh, this sort of sums up the reason for choosing a particular type of nanoparticles for uh, drug delivery or gene delivery or uh, other types of applications. And I won't uh, spend a lot of time on this, but basically in this size range here, which is roughly about 100 to 220 nanometers, we get something called the enhanced permeation and retention effect or EPR effect. That is simply, uh, the fact that the injected nanoparticles circulate for a long period of time after injection into the bloodstream. And this enables them to reach the target tissue much better than all the other sized particles or uh, particles with different charges and so on. Okay, so this is a so-called APR effect and it's important in the development of nanoparticles for targeted therapies. Uh, this effect is, uh, it leads to something called passive targeting but it's a necessary requirement for what we call active targeting, where you need to have functionalized nanoparticles that will enter the cells only, uh, only the cells of interest and leave the other cells alone, thus minimizing side effects. So this slide sums up sort of the, uh, the uh, advantages of nano versus micro in nanomedicine. Um, basically, uh, Nanoparticle-enabled therapeutics uh, rely on this increased circulation time that I mentioned before. Um, that sort of is related to the improved biodistribution. And by this, I mean there is uh, preferential accumulation at the tumor site. That's what is at least hoped for uh, due to the increased circulation half-life. 
Uh, it's uh, the nano size enables these particles to pass through leaky capillaries, unlike micron size particles, which get stuck. And that also helps to reach the target tissue. And then eventually when they do reach the target tissue, other functionalizations on the surface enable uh, better cellular penetration. So these are sort of the important, sorry. These are the important characteristics. And in a particular case of um, ocular delivery, uh, clarity of the particles, optical clarity of the particles also is a very beneficial attribute. And this is in, again, a virtue of the small size of these particles that tend to scatter much less light than micron sized particles. And also the grittiness in the eye is much less. The disadvantage of using nanoparticles for drug or gene delivery is that there is much faster release of drug from the particle compared to micron sized particles. Um, aggregation is a real problem practically and also potentially lower loading of drug in the particles, especially self-assembled systems can only take up so much particle without disassembling, okay? So this uh, slide sort of uh, serves to tell you the difference between the passive and acting targeting concepts. Um, by the way, I should mention that uh, the very first application of nanoparticles was in the area of targeted delivery. And this has long been a holy grail for drug delivery people, especially in cancer chemotherapy. Um, and I'll tell you the success uh, of these concepts in a few slides from now. But basically the passive uh, targeting mechanism I already mentioned to you, long circulation half-lives, leaky blood vessels surrounding the tissue, um, and the enhanced permeation because of the leaky vasculature and the small size of these particles that results in accumulation. It is hoped that most of the particle injected particles will end up at the tumor site, but that's not the case as I will show later. So the failure of the EPR effect is also a failure of um, um, targeted therapy. Also the reason for failure of targeted therapy. So the active strategy, which uh, enables these particles only to enter the cells of interest, relies on functionalization of the surface with antibodies specific to the tumor tissue um, and so on. Okay, so that's the active strategy and this passive strategy is simply functionalizing the particle so that it circulates in the bloodstream for a long period of time after injection. Okay, and uh, enhances the chances of it getting to the tumor site. So I have already gone through most of this, but just want to mention that for best selectivity of action need both passive and active targeting. The passive targeting enables accumulation of the tumor site in therapeutic amounts, which is a necessary requirement. Uh, the active part allows it to penetrate only cells of interest, basically tumor tissue, and that minimizes side effects, okay? Uh, so the very first product which I worked on when I was at Alza Corporation back in the 90s is uh, Doxil. That was the first one that was approved. Uh, it contains doxorubicin in the core of a self-assembled nanoliposome surrounded by polyethylene glycol functionalities, which allows for this so-called stealth properties of the magic bullet. Um, long blood circulation, half-life and so on. Size is key to the performance. Um, as well as the ability to control the release of the encapsulated active. If the encapsulated active comes out very quickly within the circulation half-life, then the product is dead because all you're doing is injecting naked drug, which is uh, phagocytosed and cleared very quickly. And in fact, the early stages of development of this product, the first clinical trial failed precisely because of that reason. So you need to be able to control the release of the enclosed bioactive, whether it's protein or gene or drug, doesn't matter um, if you are contemplating intravenous administration. Following the success of Doxil, there were uh, sort of imitation products based on passive targeting. I should say this is only a passive targeting uh, concept, Doxil. There are no functionalized surface molecules that enable selective penetration of a tumor tissue. And building on that theme, there have been several sort of Me Too products that have been approved since then. Um, active targeting has really not worked at all, uh, in spite of numerous attempts to do so. This was an early attempt here, uh, which used microRNA uh, as an adjunct to other therapies uh, for these indications. 
has uh, designated um, orphan drug designation, sorry, uh, in the US and approved in the Philippines and so on, but uh, you don't hear about this anymore. Uh, it is not a mainstay of therapies for various reasons, uh, which I will go into in a minute. These are all examples of imaging systems that are used for uh, enhanced contrast in mostly in MRI applications. Okay, so no success with active targeting concepts. And the reason for this is shown here. After a number of studies um, aimed at the biodistribution of injected nanoparticles, people have concluded that the accumulation of the tumor site is not good enough. Thanks, I mean, uh, because of the failure of the EPR effect. Most of the accumulation occurs in the liver and the spleen, and this can be exploited for uh, therapeutics that target liver proteins, for example, and I will talk about that. But uh, really the failure of um, selective targeting of tumor, uh, tumor tissue is due to the failure of the EPR effect. And that still is a problem that has not been solved. Instead, people have exploited the liver accumulation for uh, SIRNA therapeutics. Okay, so nanoparticles uh, of all types injected into the bloodstream uh, end up with very low dose in the targeted tissue is a problem. So then the question is, how can we improve the uh, use of na nanomedicine for other indications? Um, if we have indications where cellular penetration and optical clarity is required, like an ocular administration, uh, and some other examples I will show you where, where mostly it is cellular penetration, then um, uh, nanoparticles again have a role to play compared to micron size particles. But uh, in the examples that I will show, localized administration as opposed to systemic administration injections is important to enhance the bioavailability of the injected dose of the particles. Okay, so that's what I will talk about now, uh, particularly with respect to siRNA or gene silencing systems. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact that siRNA was discovered fairly um, early on, uh, won the discoverers uh, the Nobel Prize, um, but therapeutic translation was slow. And in fact, uh, nothing has happened uh, until about two or three years ago in terms of approval of products. And this is precisely because naked siRNA by itself when injected into the bloodstream uh, does not work. So it needs an anacarrier in order for it to be effective. Uh, in spite of many years of research, as I mentioned before, lots of publications, lots of patents, a number of therapeutic products is only about two or three uh, as of now. And the concurrently microRNA has also been involved in gene silencing applications, but not mRNA, which I'll talk about later. Um, so the problem for uh, injected naked um, siRNA is shown here, along with what happens to encapsulated siRNA nanoparticles. So the naked siRNA, if it is released from these nanoparticles prematurely, will be simply phagocytosed, broken up into smaller pieces, um, because they are fairly unstable with respect to nuclease or enzyme activity. And they are cleared by either the RES uptake system or by renal filtration, depending on the size. The nanoparticle on the other hand is expected in this cartoon at least to go out of the uh, circulation into the target tissue, uh, latch onto certain receptors through the surface functionalization, get inside the cytoplasm where it exerts its activity. It doesn't need to enter the nucleus, um, which is what is required for um, DNA delivery. So it needs to get into the cytoplasm, escape the endosomes and exert its action on, uh, on gene silencing, okay? So the nanocarrier is critical for it to get into the cytoplasm. And so uh, these are some of the problems uh, listed with uh, naked siRNA administration. Um, it has to avoid immune recognition, which can be done by encapsulation with suitable stealth agents uh, or by localized delivery. So that is also a very good option to increase uh, bioavailability. 
target accumulation is um, enhanced by nano size and positive charge, uh, especially with localized delivery. So I'll uh, ask you to keep in mind that vaccines are an example of localized delivery where you inject into intramuscular tissue. Okay, and sustained action is also a key attribute that allows it to not escape while in the circulation or while in extracellular tissues, the bioactive compound. So to cut a long story short, here is the SIRNA success story in one table. Um, in spite of many years of research involving intravenous administration, systemic administration, getting to target tissue and so on, um, nothing has been approved for intravenous administration for SARNA particles. All of the particles listed here undergoing clinical trials or being approved target liver proteins. Okay, so this is a consequence of the enhanced accumulation in liver tissue for any injected part nanoparticle, okay? So that's what uh, the status is currently. Uh, liver targeting seems to be, um, there are many proteins that the liver generates which are responsible for some diseases. And those are the proteins that are targeted by these gene silencing systems, okay? So liver targeting is solved with various um, cationic lipid particles as well as the functionalization or conjugation of the SARNA with uh, other molecules, uh, including polymers. So these have been fairly successful as I showed in the last slide in the clinic, um, but mostly for liver targeting. We wanted to look at uh, ocular tissue, targeting ocular tissue with localized administration. And we looked at a different kind of nanoparticle which has got this layer by layer uh, surface coating. And I will tell you about that in a minute. But the problem we wanted to solve really involves um, glaucoma filtration surgery, where in uh, extreme cases of glaucoma, where the intraocular pressure is very high, uh, the surgeon goes in, clears a channel for, these, uh, for the aqueous humor to flow out, uh, which it does, doesn't do for these patients. And uh, the channel has to be kept open for at least two weeks during the healing process um, so that the, 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 um, the channeling of the outflow is maintained. And what uh, the surgeon does currently is to dab this area with a very toxic uh, drug so that it uh, kills the fibroblasts that are responsible for closure of this channel during the healing process. So basically the channel is cut surgically and then it closes up again because of the uh, fibroblasts producing certain proteins that block up the channels. So the best solution for this is to selectively inhibit the fibroblasts. These drugs here uh, also kill other cells in the vicinity leading to occasionally blind blindness, increasing the risk of blinding complications. Whereas a selective SARNA against fibroblasts that are involved in this scar tissue formation would be the best solution to the problem. And that's what we did with researchers from SERI. Uh, and the particle we used had a hydroxyapatite core, which is about 100 to 200 nanometers in size, negatively charged. And that is surrounded by a cationic polymer, polyalarginine. In this case is the one that we prefer to use. And then the next layer is an SIRNA, which is negatively charged and so on. So you, you can build up to about 100 layers of these molecules without exceeding um, 500 nanometers. So we have used three and five layered particles. Uh, the outermost layer always has to be the cationic polymer for ease of cellular penetration. And this is to be used locally. It's a subconjunctival injection. Uh, that allows for better biodistribution, bioavailability, okay? So uh, I won't go into the details of how this prepared, but basically the outermost uh, layer is the polyalarginine, which is a positive charge, which you can measure with zeta potentials. The cargo is the SIRNA, which goes into alternating layers. And if you look at in vitro studies of cellular uptake, 
um, we find that the cellular uptake is maintained for about seven days and she'll uh, take up of these particles due to the positively charged outer species, outer uh, polyalarginine. Uh, the release of the enterosis bioactive or the bioactive in this case is siRNA occurs by defoliation. So the outermost layer has to defoliate first, exposing the inner layer of siRNA that then comes out and so on. And that process uh, lasts well beyond 14 days, which is the healing period. Um, so this is a sustained delivery system uh, uh, in, in, inside, the, um, uh, inside the body, in the eye. And how do we know the mechanism is defoliation? We have done FRET studies by tagging the adjacent layers of the polyalarginine and the SARNA with different colors and following the FRET um, over time. And again, I won't go into the details, but uh, this is all published. Um, basically the outermost uh, layer defoliates within about nine days and the second layer defoliates within about 14 days. So we have a five layered system in this case. Um, and this shows the efficacy of the sustained efficacy of the uh, five layered system versus a three layered system. Over 14 days, there's significant uh, suppression of protein production, which is responsible for the um, fibrosis or the closing up of the channel. Um, and this is the five layered system, which has a higher loading and a longer release time for the bioactive. We have substantiated this with animal studies or our colleagues at Siri have done this uh, by following uh, the closure of the channel opened with, uh, with a needle um, for 14 days using scrambled SARNA layers as control and showed that this works during the healing process. And these are some of the data that testifies to the protein uh, production inhibition over 14 days. So that's what we have learned in terms of the advantages of localized and systemic delivery. Um, so the uh, systemic delivery problem is that the targeting or selectivity is very low and due to failure of the EPR effect. If you can somehow find applications where localized delivery is possible, such as in um, ocular delivery or vaccine, as I will show in a minute, then you can increase the bioavailability as well as the selectivity. Okay, and fibrosis itself has many other applications. Uh, cardiac fibrosis, for example, is something that could be uh, addressed with localized delivery from an inserted stent, coronary stent, um, and so on. So there are many applications, including in islet transplantation for diabetics, where the transplanted islets um, are killed because of fibrosis following implantation. So that could also be addressed with coatings that prevent this from happening. Um, I want now to turn to mRNA-based uh, uh, therapeutics and vaccines um, because that is a logical application of localized delivery uh, using nanoparticles. Uh, there have been many, many trials over the last few years uh, with mRNA vaccines against infectious diseases. Um, most of them concentrate on HIV. Uh, there is one against rabies virus and Moderna, which I think you will all know, recognize as the, one of the developers of the COVID mRNA vaccine, have been working in this area for a long time against Zika virus and influenza virus. But none of these products were eventually approved. And this is a peculiar consequence of the nature of um, vaccine trials. Uh, it takes a long time. And uh, usually by the time uh, the development process is well underway and the clinical trials are underway, the, uh, the infection rates decrease considerably. So nobody's interested really in developing it any further. All activity stops or is put on hold. Um, so one of the, I suppose, the bright spots, if you want to call it that, for the COVID-19 case pandemic is that it is a longer lived infection, as unfortunately many of us now realize from global data. Uh, but it also enables uh, testing uh, and accelerated development. So what has happened is that uh, countries have invested 
in scale up and manufacture of the vaccines even before approval so that by the time they receive this emergency use approval, it's ready to be shipped out and used on patients. So basically what is happening is really a large scale clinical study now with COVID vaccines without us knowing about it. Uh, mRNA delivery systems that have been uh, considered for uh, both therapeutics and for vaccines are shown here, but this is the predominant particle. It's called a cationic lipid nanoparticle solid nanoparticle with uh, cationic lipids, which are complex to the mRNA or the siRNA in this case, that are in, enclosed in the core of the device, oh, sorry, of the self-assembled system. And they are usually um, injected into the core, so to speak. I mean, it's not easy to take hydrophilic entities and put them inside the core of a self-assembled system. That requires electroporation and things like that. And what I will show you is that uh, in our system, we don't need to resort to these techniques to get highly loaded systems that can be used in vaccine applications. The other consequence of these um, systems currently is that the enclosed vaccine material, whether it's mRNA or DNA, uh, uh, comes out fairly quickly out of the cationic lipids after they get inside the cells. And that's why we need two injections of these rather than a single dose. Sustained delivery will allow maybe, we hope, a single dose vaccine to be developed using the same bioactive molecules. These are all examples of uh, traditional vaccines. No mRNA vaccine has ever been developed and approved before COVID-19, uh, but these are the ones that have been approved during this pandemic period emergency use authorization only. Um, and BioNTech or the Pfizer vaccine uh, uses a modified mRNA uh, inside a cationic lipid. So does Moderna Therapeutic. Uh, this one is two doses, 28 days apart. This one is two doses, three weeks apart. Uh, the liquid nanoparticle, uh, sorry, lipid nanoparticle is cationic for the reasons that I mentioned earlier for cellular entry and for complexing with the uh, mRNA. The one that is being co-developed by Duke and US and Arcturus, uh, which is a company in the US, uses something called a self-amplifying replicating RNA technology, which sort of takes the place of sustained release. So once it gets into the cytoplasm, this self-amplifies and continues to produce mRNA over a longer period of time than these two uh, vaccines, which are shorter lived. Our proposal, which I'm working on with a couple of people, uh, one from you can US and one from a new HS. involves the same concept that I mentioned before, made a case of different strains being targeted with the same vaccine. So that's attractive. And uh, loading is also fairly significant compared to cationic nanoparticles. And sustained delivery, like I mentioned before, is achieved through slow defoliation, even after entering cells. So that is possible. And this has potentially the ability to, to um, be an oral or nasal vaccine. Okay, I want to stop there. I think I've taken up more than my time. These are the people I want to thank. Most of the ocular work was uh, joint collaboration with SERI um, due to, uh, thanks to an NMRC TC, a translation clinical research grant. So, uh, one of the persons who worked in that uh, ocular layer by layer system is Yang Fei Tan, who has joined me now in NUS and will be participating in the vaccine production or the vaccine development effort. Thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions and have the panelists discuss issues. Thank you very much. Maybe I get started. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Prof. Subu. Very clear and interesting talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are absolutely right when one thing 
bring to, brings to the next one, right? So in terms of fibrosis, in view of the fact that nanoparticles within minutes, they deposit to the liver, they accumulate in the liver. And due to the fact you can target fibrosis, I can see immediately that there is a connection with the NanoNash program that has been launched here in NUS mm. by Professor C.N. Lee, mm -hmm. uh, trying to tackle liver diseases and these include also fibrosis. So I think this is an excellent complementarity to our program. So Thank I'm very, you. very happy to see that you, you have been successful. But maybe uh, we so, can work together on this. Absolutely. That was my <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, then a more, more general question about maybe uh, a curiosity if you want. Uh, so you have shown very efficacious local delivery, for example, for eye delivery or in the case of the proposal of vaccine. And this is amazing through this layer by layer system. I'm wondering in case in which someone wants to do a systemic delivery, you know perfectly that in that case, you need to further decorate, if you want, a nanoparticle with hydrophilic polymers, such as polyethylene glycol, that basically you need to have, as you correctly said, a long circulation in the bloodstream. So my question is, do you expect that to somehow affect the performance of your layer by layer system? Because you are basically masking with something else. I'm just curious about that. Yeah, definitely. I think the, what we don't know for the layer by layer system is by putting on this cationic hydrophilic entity on the outside, whether it lacks similarly to PEG, which is also a hydrophilic layer that sort of expands while uh, it's circulating in the bloodstream. So that we have not studied. We don't think it'll defoliate or uh, be able to project its molecules outwards like PEG molecules do in order to escape the RES. So I don't think without any surface functionalization, our particles will be good for intravenous administration. Uh, with surface functionalization, what has happened, uh, if you look at the story, for example, of surface functionalization with PEG and an active ligand, the ratio of the two on the surface is a very important parameter. So if the ratio of PEG to the ligand is too high, then the selectivity is lost it does not go to target tissue because PEG is designed to evade target tissue. So if that ratio is too high, then it doesn't work at all. If conversely, the other part where the ligand ratio is very high or the ligand is attached to the end of a PEG molecule, it's more likely to do both. So that needs to be optimized and studied. And Bind Therapeutics did this through Bob Langer's lab uh, in a combinatorial design, but their clinical results are not very promising. So selectivity still is not uh, possible with a PEG uh, sort of uh, functionalized system. Thank you. And it's also sort of being overtaken at least for cancer by immunotherapies, which are much, much more inherently selective. So I think nanoparticles, the magic bullet for cancer is probably a thing of the past. I would like to, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I would like to yeah. ask a question um, about the issue of an isotropy in these in this, uh, nanomaterials. Because of course we work with uh, nanomaterials as well, but they are, extremely anisotropic, right? Yeah. Atomically thin films are probably in <laughs> the, an extreme of that anisotropy. So um, usually when people talk about nanomaterials in, in, in medicine, we're thinking of spherical things. So uh, what I would like to ask you is that what's the role of anisotropy when you talk about nanomaterials in medicine, if there is any? Food. Uh... I know that people have published on aspect ratios of particles and their effect on cellular uptake. And in all cases, these 
spherical particle usually is better. Um, so that is the only work that I'm aware of. The work related to the effect of aspect ratios on release of the enclosed active also uh, shows that the aspect ratio has to be close to one in order for sustained release to happen. Otherwise you get directional release uh, preferentially in one direction, the shorter diffusion length, so to speak. Sorry, Antonio, that's the only work that I'm aware of. Uh, toxicity well, also may have been studied with different aspect ratios. Yeah, well, of course, you know, I, I, you know, people may have tried carbon nanotubes and things like that, which are extremely anisotropic too. Yeah. But uh, uh, of course, I, I'm very interested in how 2D materials can be used in medicine. So this is why I was asking this question. I understand. And, uh, but it's interesting. Maybe it's a white space that has to be explored. Exactly. I invite you to explore it. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so, um, just want to make a note to the audience members, please uh, start writing questions and uh, some of them may be taken up by the speaker or the panelists. So we, um, just a reminder to the audience, please type in your questions. So probably I can continue. So thank you very much. It was really amazing. Okay, yeah. We, we saw uh, so different uh, generation of nanoparticles. Like first generation, it just was modified by drug. So the second generation with stealth nanoparticles, the third generation targeted nan nanoparticles. What do you think? What will be a fourth generation? What is, which direction shall we go? <laughs> well, having just sort of uh, killed the uh, magic bullet concept. <laughs> I don't think anything further will happen in that area by intravenous administration. Um, I think we have to be more clever in delivering these systems from implanted uh, devices that are close to target tissue. So drug device combinations or gene device combinations that enable localized delivery, not necessarily through injections as in the case of vaccines. Um, is going to be the fourth generation sort of device concept. Having said that, I will also say that given the very, very promising development of mRNA vaccines, it is possible that people will pay more attention to cancer vaccines. And that may come back into vogue with the success of mRNA. Uh, mRNA therapeutics is also something not to be ignored because if you can produce uh, protein uh, or antibodies, for example, as a therapeutic uh, effort using the right mRNA against various diseases, that becomes very attractive also. Thank That's you. where I hope the next generation of products will come from. Thank you a lot. But what do you think about uh, patient targeted therapy? Yeah, the personalized therapy concept, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, certainly for um, many immunotherapies, this is already being practiced and uh, will continue to be practiced. And one of the things I should mention that uh, I forgot to mention is that um, the, the EPR effect actually works for certain patients with a genetic composition that is amenable to long circulation half-lives and target tissue accumulation. I don't know the details of the genetic composition that enables this to happen, but uh, studies have been done and a certain subclass of patients do respond uh, or have significant EPR accumulation and target tissue. So that might be something that doctors might do in the future is to pre-screen those patients for uh, cancer chemotherapy or targeted therapy. That might still happen. Um, yeah, the other areas uh, of personalized medicine that might be impacted by nanoparticles, um, I'm not too sure about, but uh, I'm sure there do exist several areas. Perhaps you, you know of some areas, Daria. 
no, I'm absolutely, absolutely new in this field. So oh, just okay. Very interested in, I mean, the, because the, it's, it's, it sounds very amazing, but how realistic is it? This is very interesting. Yeah. Hey, Subu. Uh, Hi, no, it, it, great talk. Very clear. Thank you. You know, I, I want to go back to the slide. Uh, let's not go back to the slide, but you, you provided the three vaccines that are available or under development. They all take advantage of a LNP layer, an encapsulation layer. And that's great. But, you know, if I look at the, you also provided a, a toolbox of delivery systems, a very comp you know, a variety of, of molecules that self-assemble into the capsule that's going to bring the mRNA in. Mm -hmm. So when I look at that, I look at a huge matrix of variables, right? Not only do you have a large diversity of lipids for that matter, or cationic polymers, you have a diversity of how you can put them together, conditions. I, I, do, do you have any sense of how that the complexity of that problem was handled by uh, the people that made the vaccines? Um, I'm not sure exactly what level of uh, studying or studies were done prior to this emergency use authorization. I suspect in the case of these vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines, the development cycle was so short that nothing much was done. Just to give you an example, you know, Moderna stores its vaccine at minus 70 degrees for stability reasons. The Pfizer one is stored at minus 20, if I recall correctly. And that's because of lack of stability data. They simply haven't had time to look at the long-term stability of these particles. Uh, having said that, the other issues also probably were not studied in detail, such as loading of the, uh, of the mRNA into the particles, the sustained release, and the, what I call intracellular release, which is very important for sustained action. So basically the cationic nanoparticles that were listed uh, for the Pfizer and the, and the um, Moderna vaccines, they enter the, they exhibit some re sustained release outside of the cells. Mm -hmm. But once they enter the cells and into the endosomes, they basically chew out the mRNA so there is no sustained release within the cells. In our siRNA study within the cells, the layer by layer system still uh, enables endosomal escape as an intact particle, and then slowly releases the siRNA um, over time. That uh, almost guarantees sustained activity. And, At least, and, you know, more broadly, uh, the question I was trying to encapsulate is, how good is the predictive theory, right? Mm -hmm. that, that is available to say, okay, this particular lipid and this particular conditions will give you a, 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 a carrier that has certain stability and a particular in vivo uh, activity versus having to work through this by trial and error. Yeah, unfortunately I'm not aware of anything that really is predictive enough. The problem is in vitro, in vivo correlations are still hazy for many of these applications. The in vitro modeling exists, but uh, exactly what happens, and even the animal models that are used sometimes are not appropriate, mm -hmm. not predictive, especially in the case of cancer, where tumor, uh, xenografted tumors in mice simply don't predict what happens in man or woman <laughs> for that matter. But uh, yeah, that, that, that is the underlying problem, is in vitro, in vivo correlations. Yeah, in fact, uh, if I may add, uh, there, are, there is a developing really uh, discipline and area of research that call, is called IVIVC, mm. in vitro, in vivo correlation, that mm -hmm. is trying to model and basically starting from the clinical data to try to then create a predictive system that can, you know, predict new type of nanoformulation. Absolutely. And, and that's, and, uh, to me, might be even better than, uh, than creating a system and trying an error and define at the laboratory scale and then trying to translate it. 
Yeah, I, but there, I should also add that there is effort on what are called organoids with a circulation system that are being developed by the tissue engineers, which may substitute for some talk studies uh, in animals. In other words, they use human organoids to hope for a better predictive model. That might also be helpful in the future. Let me, um, again, just ask the audience, um, please uh, write in your questions uh, and uh, the panel and uh, Subu will, uh, will address the questions. Um, maybe just to sort of uh, make people feel more confident about being a complete non-expert and being able to ask questions. Maybe I can ask a sociological question. So the Pfizer Sorry. and Moderna uh, quickly came to market and now has population-based studies in Israel that, I mean, uh, that now show it's, you know, 90 something percent effective. What happened to Duke and US? What, what were the reasons why it was slow to come to the game? I do not know the answer to that question. I know that the clinical trials are going on. I'm not sure how successful the trials are. Uh, in terms of technology, is there any reason that uh, the result would be any different based on the science? The, the mRNA is a new entity. I think um, very different from the mRNAs used by Pfizer or by Moderna because it's called a self-amplifying mRNA. Maybe there are some safety issues with that that need to be solved, but I do not know the answer. So audience, this is your cue to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. If not, we'll just have the panelists continue talking, but uh, anyone <laughs> okay. in the audience, here's your chance. So probably a technical question. Is, uh, but since I'm very interested in polyelectrolyte, so how, how many polymers did you try before to come to alginate? <laughs> Uh, probably about 15 or 16, something so, like that. So why did it, why, <laughs> why, did it, why arginine? Uh, arginine had the best cellular penetration properties and it comes in a range of molecular sizes or molar masses. And the one we hit upon was 70 kilodaltons. That seems to work the best. Um, I think primarily due to charge density considerations and ability to complex the SARNA. Um, as well as cellular penetration. So the outermost layer, which is uh, made up of this 70 molar, I mean, 70 kilodalton molar mass material has very good cell penetration properties compared to say polyelysine um, and other materials that are conventionally used for cellular penetration. And the polyelarginine is also, we found this particular molar mass of polyelarginine also is less cytotoxic uh, much more biocompatible than uh, lysine. And it's also known that the drug discovery is used uh, quite a lot of machine learning. So do you think it can be applied for such kind of research also? I'm, I'm sorry, what was the... For in drug discovery, part? for example, machine learning. Discovery. Is, yeah, used quite a lot. Um, perhaps, I'm not sure. But what, what George, Georgia, that's Georgia might have an answer to this. I, I don't know about anything drug discovery. I'm, I'm wondering sure I what kind of criteria can be used, for example, as a standard for such kind of system. I'm not sure I understood the, your question. If you ask me one way to eventually screen for uh, different drugs or actives uh, that are encapsulated, incorporated inside the nano particle or vesicle. I agree with uh, Prof. Subu that the organoids seem to be quite good to be in, because they are able to rec recapitulate, for example, a tumor environment or a disease environment. They are able, but they are much faster and eventually less expensive because in many cases they are based on microfluidics. So you don't need a lot. They are useful tools to eventually do drug screening and identifying candidates that are more likely to work in vivo. Uh, this, if I understood correctly, your, your question. Mm. Yes, absolutely. But what do you measure? Do you, you measure this? It depends on what is your, your, your use of the nanoparticles for, let's assume it's cancer, even though we mentioned the lack of magic. Uh, if in that case, you look at the cytotoxicity, the 
a rest of the size cycle, a little bit the mechanism that is involved in the uh, efficacy of a certain active. Yeah, with regard to the cationic polymer question, Daria, that you asked, uh, Guy Bazan here is working on a very interesting oligo, oligomer, which is cationic and self-assembling. And that is one of the things we want to try in the outermost layer also of an encapsulated particle. So we got a question for our panelists from the audience. Um, well, two questions. The first one is, um, any information on the delivery system for Sinovac? Oh. <laughs> any, any Sinovac problem? is an inactivated virus. So it doesn't have any mRNA. I mean, the mRNA is inside the virus. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. I mean, if you want to, uh, from, from, uh, from, from Ben T. If you, if you, can you see the question, uh, Sibu? Uh, let me see. Just click on the Q&A button and you'll see the question. Biomaterials and neural applications. What are your thoughts on Neuralink? Elon Musk in brackets. Have you investigated the nanomaterials you're developing for neural tissue as well? Thanks, Benjamin. Uh, great question. I have not explored neural tissues at all. I'm sure Elon Musk has already solved this problem, so I don't want to tread on his toes. <laughs> Just joking. But anyway, uh, no, I have not explored neural tissue. It would be very interesting to look at neural connections, connective tissue, and uh, how we can make it bioactive for developing neural tissue. Great question. Okay, any... Um... I'm sorry, connected to that anisotropy might be interesting, Antonio, in connecting neural tissues together. Any final um, comments by the panelists before we give uh, Subu the last word? Uh, Guy Bazan? I have lots of questions, lots and lots, uh, you know, um, but uh, I mean, coming, but, but just, just that's so curious. The rate of exfoliation from your multi-layer nanoparticle determines the duration of the mRNA release. And you pick L-arginine, poly-L-arginine. Right. Would it be helpful to have a, a mimic that exfoliates more slowly? Um, yeah. I mean... Uh... I mean, if, if, on, if the duration of the therapy is dependent on the release of the mRNA, you might want to look into derivatives or, you know, just modify. This, this is an excellent question. We really need to have a toolkit of slow, fast defoliation outer molecules. Really need to have that because the, um, especially in the uh, vaccine application, it is not right. clear what duration we need for release and how rapidly dividing the cells are. Because rapidly dividing cells sort of kill the sustained release uh, concept to some degree. And, so, and the other thing, which is interesting, right? I mean, as, as you work your way down the onion, mm -hmm. right? But uh, you might want to have layers that have different exfoliation rates. Yes. But so that, I think it's a really, but I, I yeah, especially if you have two different mRNAs, Correct. one therapeutic and one vaccine. Uh, yeah, you might need Super different uh, Super Super rays. Yeah. Um, Daria, any final uh, final comments? Well, for me, it was amazing, really, uh, very interesting, because you're always uh, looking for specific examples, and uh, especially, for example, would like to, to explain students the whole concept of drug delivery, and uh, these examples are really amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Georgia? Uh, I think that I, I have many questions, but I think we can <laughs> have, have them over coffee. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. We'll have coffee with Subu. Antonio, any thoughts? Well, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, it, uh, for me, it was uh, quite educational. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Subu. And uh, the final word is yours. Our final word is simply, I want to really thank Adam, you yourself for putting this together and uh, all the panelists, fantastic questions and uh, 
good discussion great discussion thank you all okay thank hope you hope to work with most of you in the future <laughs> and uh, to everyone in the audience keep your eyes open for the next uh, seminar we have about uh, one or two each month so keep your eyes open for the next one thank you thank you bye bye thanks bye bye